Are we gonna have a problem with sound in the back? We just have to do it. So here we are. I never thought in a million years that I would one day direct and produce my own film. But I never thought one day I would also be a reality star. See, let me back up a little bit. In 2008, I was selected and chosen to be on a nationally syndicated reality show. My face and my voice was gonna be seen and heard in front of millions of televisions broadcast throughout the nation. I mean, this was it. This was, this was gonna be my, my shot to become this huge celebrity that I always knew I could be. I came off the show and I realized very quickly that it's not as easy as you think. Now I was signing autographs, I was taking pictures. I was, in my own right, a local celebrity. But that ended very quickly. And very quickly people forgot who you were and stopped asking for those pictures and stopped asking for the autographs. I started thinking that I did something wrong. <laughs> so what does any person in their right mind do to answer a question? They empty their bank account, they hire film crews, they travel all across the country, and they talk to other reality stars to find out if their experience was just like that. So let's start off, for the people that don't know you, who are you and what is your relationship to reality television? Uh, all right, maybe that's not what a normal, rational person does, but that's what I do. So join me on my quest to find out what happens when your 15 minutes runs out. What happens to a reality star on their 16th minute of fame. Well, if you don't know who I am and my relationship to reality TV, then you don't know reality TV by now. I'm Richard Hatch, the original survivor. Hey, I'm Angelina, formerly from the Jersey Shore. Now I'm on VH1's uh, Celebrity Couples Therapy. My name's Robert Galinsky. My relationship to reality television is that I make reality TV stars. My name is Dr. Nicole Williams, and the reality show I was on was The Mole. I am Marcellus Reynolds. I'm a television host, a fashion stylist, and I've been a reality star since 2002. I'm from Big Brother and Big Brother All Stars. I'm Dr. Drew Pinsky. Uh, I'm an addictionologist, internist. Uh, I did a show called Love Line and a show called Celebrity Rehab, and I'm currently on HLN. My name is Merce Schaffer. I was the host and co-creator of Reality Obsessed. Obviously, I love the shows, and I am Reality Obsessed, but I'm more obsessed with making money and making myself famous. I am Michael Scoopin, and I was on the second season of Survivor, Survivor of the Australian Outback. I'm Robert, and I'm from Hell's Kitchen, season five and six. So when people say, you have 15 minutes of fame. Well, I got a half hour. My name is Russell Swan, and um, I was a contestant on Survivor season 19, Samoa. My name is Jason Prager. I am the one buff geek from Beauty and the Geek, the fifth and final season. I am a big fan of reality television because it gives people like me a chance to be on TV and entertain people like you. Well, my name is Trends. Some people know me as Mr. Locario. And my relationship to reality TV is that I've done like a whole bunch of shows, like Olive New York, Switched Up, You Rock, Let's Roll, I'm a media whore. You know, that's what I do. I am Frenchie from VH1. I've been on a couple of different reality shows. I was on The Rock of Love first with Brett Michael, and then I was on Charm School. If I could change anything, I wouldn't change nothing at all because I love me. <laughs> I'm Billy Garcia from Survivor Cook Island, MTV's I Want to Be a WWF Superstar, Reality Obsessed, and TV Made Me Do It. Would I say reality television is real? I would say, in reality, it's television. <laughs> Hold on one second, sorry. Hello. Yeah. When we die and people are reading up about, you know, 2011 in the history books is going to be the rise and growth of reality television. Once it started airing, I can't even describe how the insanity increased. 
the rock star is dead and the reality TV star is the new rock star. Each show is a snapshot of some part of our culture. They're breaking the rules, they're pissing people off, saying things people don't want to hear. Come on, let's get to it, let's get to it. Am I talking about rock stars? No, I'm talking about reality stars. Did you think reality television would make you rich and famous? Yeah, I was just that stupid. <laughs> it started off like this, starts off like, hey, um, don't I know you for something? And they're like, you're on that show. Wait a minute, aren't you on that show? And I'm like, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on that show. Five people used to know me, now five million people know me. That was cool, you kick ass! Oh my god, I love you so much! From this point on, no matter what, my life is completely different. Since Hell's Kitchen, I mean, my life has been a roller coaster. I mean, my phone blew up the night of the show airing. It got crazy. Everybody knows who I am. I can't even walk to the store. You know, sending naked pictures of themselves. You're being stopped at the mall. Pictures in diapers hanging from a tree. People calling me asking for money. My name is Ruth. I'm a grandmother up in Boston. You call me, I want to know that you're all right. People showed up in my house at 3 in the morning, drunk. I mean, a lot of my ex-boyfriends came out of the woodworks, and they were like, hey. <laughs> I would imagine it could cause some serious psychological trauma if you aren't clearly aware of who you are. It was kind of fun, I had to admit. So I set off on this journey to find out the truth about reality television. And where else can you start but the biggest and most watched reality television show in the history of reality television? No, I'm not talking about American Idol. I'm talking about the, the one that started it all. That's right, Survivor. What was your main reasoning for wanting to actually get into reality television? Like, what, what was, why did you want to go on Survivor, basically? Was it money? Was it fame? Was it girls? What, what was it? Uh, I was always a fan of Survivor, and uh, I've seldom, like, uh, turned down a good dare. But once uh, I started getting in through the process, the realization started setting in that this could be good for my band, this could be good for me personally. I'm a, I would consider myself a reality celebrity in that I was, at that time, and maybe even to today, the most famous person from my season just because of my look and then the crazy way that I left. My prize isn't even the million dollars. My prize was that I, I, fell in, I, I fell in love in this game, love at first sight. Her name is Candace. We sort of mouthed the words, I love you, to one another, and so that was my prize, and my prize was her. We love you. I love you. It was probably the biggest crash and burn, and, and definitely of that year, at least according to VH1. And uh, uh, probably one of the biggest crash and burns of all time in Survivor. So you're absolutely sincere right now. I'm dead serious. I actually told my tribe that my plan was to get famous. The police did stay out of my way. I'm going to do a lot of antics out there. Stay out of my way, and then whatever I, I, I get booked for, I'll share with them. Second person voted out of Survivor Cook Island, Billy. How do you want to be remembered and represented on, you know, as Billy Garcia, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I would like to be remembered as uh, somebody that people had a good time watching on TV. For whatever the hour that they saw me, the, however many episodes, they were able to f forget their regular life and just have a good time watching me on TV. Richard Hatch was sick. Richard Hatch is going to... Richard Hatch is... Richard Hatch. Richard Hatch leaves federal court. Richard Hatch will continue to pay for tax evasion by state. Richard Hatch was one of television's first reality stars. They're not voting me off because I'm not letting them. The guy who on the first season of Survivor, people love to hate. Got the million dollar check written already. I mean, I'm, I'm the winner. And it's that kind of cocky attitude that makes people really hate your guts. Survivor, my season, the original season, was the first uh, reality show on any major network. People come on to these reality programs for lots of dis different reasons. I could not have cared less about the fame. Uh, it had no draw for me, no pull. The money, it was a million bucks, cool. And it was doing something I would have paid to do. I would have paid to go camping for a month in this, on this island and play some kind of a social game. How much fun. And it turned out to be that. 
Can you talk about what, what has happened to you? Can you talk, what sure. can you talk? Uh, yeah, no, I was uh, convicted of tax evasion and uh, served nearly four years in prison. Uh, as a result, more time uh, than anyone in history has ever been given. And I'm absolutely, unequivocally in innocent. It's crazy. It if is people crazy, really I'm, knew I'm, what I'm happened. Just, He's like, you don't even know what to ask. No, it's, I don't. Like, yeah. Because, I mean, what, what naturally comes to my mind is then how do they convict you? How did how do they get a conviction? What 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 were you ultimate? I mean, that you're saying you were convicted of tax evasion. Correct. And there were a couple of errors that were legitimate. Right. I was paid as an individual for part of a year, and then it was switched to being paid as a company. So a piece was missing. Whatever that just needs to get put back in when an assessment's done, and when you're told this needs to be changed. But they took those errors and claimed that I evaded taxes intentionally, because it has to be willful. They didn't understand, even the judge, anybody, uh, didn't understand the tax system. They didn't understand that we earned the money in Malaysia and how the contract related to having a requirement that taxes owed to Malaysia are paid before we leave the island. Over 50 million viewers, including some at the IRS, watched Hatch walk away with the million dollar prize. This conviction reflects the Internal Revenue Service's commitment to enforce the tax laws of the United States. And there's just simply no, there's just no question. I have been the subject of a witch hunt much because of who I was portrayed or how I was perceived uh, on, on that show. It's an awful situation, and my family and I have paid an extraordinarily high price, but I've paid it. And, uh, you know, what, what do you do? You move on from there. With no regrets? No regrets. Uh, my name is Mertz Jaffer. Celebrities are nothing without their fans, but when it comes to reality television, there's one fan who is above the rest. Here's a super fan who parlayed his obsession into a full-time career. My name is Mert Straffer, and I am reality television. So I started a website with a friend from college, and he built it, and it was dedicated to the show Survivor. And he said to me, you know, this is not going to work. You know, we tried it, it's not going to work. And I said, you know, give it some time. And it was almost like magic that I got a call um, from CBS saying, you know, you're the only Canadian covering the show. Would you like to come to our finale? And when I was there and I watched the show, I saw everybody, you know, like going up to this party afterwards. And I remember walking up and saying, hey, I want to go to that party. And the guy's like, you're never going to go to that party. I remember it like the back of my hand in Central Park 2004. The following year, I went to the uh, Survivor Thailand finale, but this time I went in with a plan. And my plan was to befriend some of the people prior to the show. And one of them um, invited me to go as one of her guests to the finale, and I had access to the party that Mr. Central Park told me I would never get into. And when I was at that party, I was handing out business cards, and I said, you know, a lot of these reality stars, I don't see them doing anything after the show. My pitch was basically that I'm running a website out of my parents' basement in Canada. Can you give me 10 minutes a week to write a little column about the following season? And all of them were very agreeable. And, you know, I did this for about two, three years, and I eventually had a network of about 50 people that were writing for the site. And our hits went from 300 to about 200,000. And that's how Reality Obsessed was inspired. Raw reality meets funny fantasy on TV Tropolis when a TV junkie turns the camera on himself. My dad gave me great advice once, and he said that I don't really care what you do with your life. I want you to pick one thing and become the best in the world at that thing, and the money will come. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, you gotta pick a specialty that nobody else can do. Or if you're a dentist, you can only make one type of dentures that nobody else can do. For me, it was reality television. I wanted to make sure that there is no one living or breathing that knows it better than I do. And, you know, by doing that, like, every all the opportunities came. Reality Obsessed, greatest show of all time. It Ever. is revolutionary wow. television. I'm telling you right now, OK? And it's on at 8 o'clock, too, tomorrow on TV. Okay. My feeling is if you're on TV, 
you're a celebrity. And I don't care what that is. I don't care if you're like setting a world record for the longest fingernails or you're winning a million dollars on Survivor. The bottom line is not everybody gets on TV. So have you done any, have you signed any autographs? Yes, I have signed autographs. How do you feel? I, um, feels pretty damn good. I don't know if, uh, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm getting a call from my fan club. Please excuse me one minute. Mom? I feel like anyone who's been on TV, even if it's for like five seconds, you know, you're a celebrity. Tell me about the first time you signed an autograph. How'd first that go time down? I signed an autograph, I was at Dunkin' Donuts. I see this little girl come up to me, and she's like, ah, were you on Beauty and the Geek? Bah. So did you feel like a celebrity at that point? Yes, I felt like a celebrity because she asked me, oh my god, you eat at Dunkin' Donuts? Occasionally. Yes, I felt like the real celebrity, and I went back to making $10 an hour. I think it was at a, a diner. I was eating with my friend, and some little girl came over to me and asked me for one, and I wrote little hearts on it for her, and I'm like, but at the same set, like, th thought, I was like, why was this little girl watching the show? Oh my god, she should not be watching this. You don't sign anymore. You, now you take a picture, and everyone has a phone. Everyone. In Australia, I was mobbed in the way, like, a real celebrity would be mobbed here. I mean, crazy, crazy mobbed. Weird autographs. People want me to sign their hat, sign their clothes, sign papers, sign this one girl wanted me to sign her butt. No, I never thought I was a celebrity. By any stretch of the imagination. To have somebody come up and say, oh, can I take a picture with you? Can I have your autograph? That is just so bizarre. Do you think the term uh, reality star is an accurate term? You're not a star of anything. No, reality star is a misnomer. So, so technically, a reality person shouldn't be able to call themselves a celebrity. Of course not. Are you a celebrity? Oh, well, I'm definitely not an A-list celebrity. <laughs> I would say. I'm not saying now. At that time, when you signed your autograph, are you a celebrity? You know, we have a fan base, and if you have a fan base, you're a celebrity. I consider somebody on Survivor a celebrity. Yes. I felt like it, but I felt like it was fake. You don't have to necessarily go and go to acting school to be a celebrity, you know what I mean? Uh, you don't have to be a singer to be a celebrity. Most of the shows are people just on there just so they can say they've been on TV. It's like, oh, really? You've been on TV? So have thousands of others. No big deal. Come on. Unfortunately, in America, we are a celebrity-driven celebrity driven society. So in saying that, hey, you know, I was one of those people, you know, people do get jealous of that and they do want that kind of attention. A lot of times people will come in and say, I want to be famous. And what's awesome about that is they don't know that there's something deep down inside burning that they want to tell the world. And that's why they want to be famous. We live in a world where everybody didn't get loved enough, didn't, didn't get liked enough, didn't get enough attention and they feel like if they get that moment on television, whether that moment is good or bad, whether that moment is positive or negative, that for that moment, they got the attention and the love and the, and the sometimes respect that they need. I think one of the biggest things that we reference in the reality television world is the enormous success of the show Jersey Shore. Now, Angelina appeared on Jersey Shore for two seasons, and both seasons, she left the show. So, how bad did it affect Angelina? I had no idea about reality TV. Like I, like I said, I don't really watch, re I didn't watch reality TV. I wasn't into it. Like, I liked music videos. That was my main thing. I, I just knew it was like a party type of show. I really didn't know what it was gonna be called. Like I said, it wasn't Jersey Shore yet. Um, but on the paperwork, it said Guido, so I was a little freaked out because I didn't want to be stereotyped as like that Guida, Guido type of girl. And like, I was just like, what am I getting myself into? But yeah, no, I didn't think I was gonna be famous. I didn't think I was gonna make a lot of money. I didn't think I was gonna be famous. And I had no idea what was gonna come out of this, but I did it anyway. You just don't care, like seriously. Shut the f up, you I was basically portrayed as the villain of the show, like the girl that everybody hated, the drama, the this, the that. For example, on my show, I was I had Angelina Ronnie Day. We went shopping, we went to the gym, we hung out, we ate together, 
We had good conversations in the car in Miami about Sammy and all that. They didn't show it. They showed all the fights I had, though. Keep it gangsta. Keep it gangsta. Don't do that to me right now. I'm gonna leave. On the show, Jersey Shore, I was betrayed like the girl likes to fight and all that. I mean, I do have a mouth, but I don't really like to get into fist fights. But if I have to throw down, if somebody hits me first, I'm gonna beat the out of you. Bring the gun! Bring it up, bro! That's all right, two girls! Don't get schnook! No TVs, no computers, no radio, no phones, except the house phone, which is tapped. And what do you do? Why, why do you think they do that? Because you want drama. They want drama. They want everybody to sit around, and then there's going to be a fight that arises. That are, you know, arises. Um, hello? Are you, you stupid? They're taking their underwear off in the jacuzzi. Are you dumb? Hello? That's classy. No. So, do you think your your true personality was represented on TV? Or? I definitely don't think that my true personality was represented the right way on TV. Um, I'm a very fun, outgoing person. I like to party. I like to have a good time. I am very loving. I'm a very affectionate person. Like, I don't like to really, I don't want to be portrayed as this girl anymore, you know? I, like, I want people to know the real me. These people don't even know me, you know what I mean? They just see what they see on TV, and I'm portrayed like a, a, a very hard, very bad way, like horrible way, actually. And it's, it's definitely upsetting, to be honest with you. So let's take a look at one of the buffest geeks I've ever seen. That's right, the real six pack situation. My man, Jason Prager. People are desperate to be on a reality show. I should know I was one of them. When I first got here, I, I, I was a shy, introvert person. But then I think it was the different challenges, the talent show, the firefighter challenge. When I go home, my friends and family will see an immense difference. Beauty and the Geek was the first show I ever auditioned for, and I got on. I'm, I'm just that good. Oh, you. This is a chicken cutlet of some kind, and they gave it to me and they put it in to make like me look like I have boobs. Yeah. I am still a man! This is without a doubt one of the hardest things that anyone could do is getting on a reality show. Everyone comes up and they tell me, oh, you know, you got a show. Get me on the real world. Get me on pickup bars. Get me on this. You did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just because I did doesn't mean you can do it. They're very beautiful. They've always had that to align, whereas we did not. We actually had to have a talent, otherwise we would tie off in Darwinism. It's, it's not the life-changing experience. Every experience changes you, obviously, especially one like that. But change your entire life? I don't think so. I learned that beautiful girls are willing to accept me and want to fight for me. Life pretty much went back to exactly as it was before. People think that reality TV can solve all their problems. Maybe even I did before I did my show. Life is going to be so much better after it. It's going to be the show's going to be huge or get more work after. I'm just telling you right now, just being on reality TV, your average reality show, is not going to solve all your problems. If you win American Idol, you may, you're selling 10 million CDs a year, yeah, that'll probably solve your problems. If you win Survivor, you win a million dollars, you win the car. Well, even look at Richard Hatch. I mean, look, it actually gave him more problems. But just being on the show, your average show, unless you're like a real, real stand out on the major, major show, you're just gonna go back to your life. There's only been one contestant that's ever appeared on Hell's Kitchen twice, and it's my good friend, Robert. Now, Robert has a great backstory behind him as well. A true inspirational story for the public. I actually knew the uh, winner of season two, Heather West. She was the pastry chef at um, a restaurant in West Hampton. I was the sous chef. And somehow she got fired, an argument with the chef. And a month later, I'm flipping through the tube, and I see her on the show. And I'm like, if this can do it, I'm doing it. You know what I mean? What the? Absolutely. So you went for an audition? What was, what was that like? Uh, I went for an audition. There was um, almost 1,000, 1,500 people. And I was like, this is just, this is ridiculous right here. I, I got better things to do. But I had a shirt on that said, I beat anorexia across the front of it. So <laughs> that got me moved right to the front of the line. You know what I mean? This is the most prestigious, honorable chance of a lifetime <laughs> to work at the most. <laughs> 
It's <laughs> got it down. Greatest. <laughs> I was just having fun, man. You gotta have fun. Like, don't take it. It, it. You really wanna know what I can do? Put me in a kitchen. That's all I can say. Watercress? Wrong. P tendrils. Dude, does it look like I eat P tendrils? When I left, when I had that pericarditis, I was pissed off, man. I was, I was hot. When they were like, you're done, I was like, bullshit, I ain't done, you know? I got, I'm so far into it now. Like, what are, what are you gonna do? And then pretty much Gordon pulled me and he was like, bro, you've done an amazing job. So take care of yourself and for your family and you'll have, you know, basically, like, it's not over for you, meaning, you know, this is gonna change your life forever. You, you, you don't even know that yet. The object of me being on Hell's Kitchen was to win a restaurant. I own two, and that quarter million dollar salary, prize money that I could have won twice, I've already made that. So you tell me if I, I'm a loser. If I ain't the Rocky story of reality TV, there ain't nothing, you know what I mean? I come from dog and I make something out of nothing. People aspire to that, and people see themselves into that. And if I could do it, you could do it. People want that, that's the American dream, man. <laughs> I like this shirt, where's this from? It's actually vintage. It's a Comisa Cubano. You're right. I, I couldn't see why anyone would think you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> my main reason for going into reality television was to get my ex-boyfriend back, who was cheating on me with a reality person. But I think the bigger reason I did the reality show was because I was at a crossroads in my life. I was looking for a new challenge. I was looking for something to sort of propel me out of the rut I was stuck in. The rumors are true. <laughs> Like, he wears a bathrobe, hello? <laughs> he owns a bathrobe. <laughs> I think 18 million people watched my season of Big Brother, so immediately I had a fan base that either loved me or hate me, but followed me. You, know, you probably feel like, what the hell did you bring me here for? I don't hate you, I love you. You're my ducky. Everyone around me told me that if I did a reality show, it would ruin my career. And you still did it anyway. And I still did it anyway. I got to show my ass on nationwide television, which is sort of liberating. Everybody wants to feel like a star. Everybody wants to think that they're special. And I really do believe that that's it at the end of the day. So my reality television career started with a show called The Mole. And if you watch the show, you would know that I had an arch enemy or how we were portrayed on television to be two people that hated each other. So I figured, let's give her a call and see if her experience was much like mine. All right, Nicole. Um, Hi, Paul. Hello. Me and you got a, a pretty bad, you know. Uh... No kidding. Edit. Previously on the mole, Paul and Nicole had it out for each other from the start. Nicole is the type of person you love to hate. I hate her. Nicole has been nothing but just like this in my ear. Yeah, you threatened my life. That's not you playing your game. I love you, Paul. Kiss my ass, okay? All you are is talk, and I'm tired of it. Well, not, not even the end. I mean, we are who we are. We did sure. what we did. We did there's what no, we did. There's yeah. no denying that. No denying it. Do you think that your personality was properly represented? No. I actually did what I did on the show. It was me. So you can't really say, oh, no, that wasn't me. It was me, but when you're filming any reality show, and I'm going to speak in generalities, you're under such duress that you become an alternate version of yourself, like the more extreme version. You'd be like extreme whoever you are. It takes and it multiplies at times 10. Obviously, we know what you do for a living, right? Yes. You're a doctor. What kind of doctor are you? I'm an OBGYN. Hmm. Baby, surgery, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, so you got a pretty positive response from your family pretty and much. your friends. What about your job? What happened? I got fired. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm gonna kill you while you sleep. Threatening my life over a game. You can't handle this already. I can do it and not leave any forensic evidence. All you are is talk, and I'm tired of it. Okay, wake up dead. <laughs> wait, wait. Let's, I got fired let's a rewind. month after I got back. A month after you got back from the show. Now, did the show air and you got fired? Yeah. So they waited until the show aired until mm -hmm. they fired you? Yeah. Did they give you a reason why? No, it wasn't working out. An episode occurs, you go into work the next day, they tell you this is not working they out. They told me that we needed to have a meeting. Do you think it was a direct result of things that, the way you portrayed yourself? I think so. When you left the hospital that day, or mm -hmm. the doctor's office that day, mm -hmm. um, did you start to regret being on that show? In the tiniest way I did, kind of regret being on the show because my life would have been a lot easier. I asked you, did I ask you, do you think reality television is real? No, you didn't ask me that. Do you think reality not. television is real? No. Wow. No, this shit is not real. Um, no, I don't think reality television is real. I think anything you see on TV is altered. No. What you're seeing on the show is real. A lot of it, maybe 99% of it, is just taken way out of context. So you're taking people with sort of psychological, psychiatric liabilities, and then you're putting them in situations that are not real. They're extraordinary. No. There's not a single thing that's real about reality television. It's totally 100% real because people need to understand we don't have no scripts. It's it's not scripted. You're not told what to say. You know, they, they would get, like, bits and pieces of real. But as long as there's a camera around, you know, it's never going to be real. I always say it's theater in the round. It's three months of improvisation. You know, the, I'm not sure the public realizes that reality television is not reality in the sense that, not that it's scripted, but it's hyper-reality. The circumstances and the way that they're, uh, the participants are manipulated are extraordinary. Reality television for me is 100% real. I've never been through more bull in my life. First of all, like, during the, during the, the breaks, Mike is sitting there with a pen and paper, like, oh, what am I going to say? Oh, I got to remember this line. I got to remember this line. Whoever invented the name reality TV threw people off because people really think it's got to be real. It ain't real. It's not. It's entertainment. So I think that the, the definition has to change a little bit. But aside from that, yeah, I think it's real. What the viewing audience sees is a part of the realness and not the entirety of the realness. People in this business, I think they know that reality is not really reality, if you're really smart. But it is. It is, but it's not. <laughs> it's weird. Like, I, I don't know, how, to, how do you describe that? I mean, that's, what I'm, that's this whole movie is trying I mean, to figure that out. How do you describe that? Is I, it I don't know. Well, I think that people don't hide who they are. All the stuff about, I got a bad edit, you know, like they made me look like a terrible person. That is 100% garbage, you know? You said it. They can cut it whatever they, they want, but you said it. Um, so, you know, I mean, you have to take responsibility for what you say and not complain about it after. Yeah, I think reality television is real, but with an asterisk. So I started wondering uh, about the effects that this whole situation has on people and their minds, their mindsets, their mind frames. Um, I know myself, it kind of screwed me up a little bit. Um, and I knew there was only one place I could possibly turn to answer questions about the pattern of reality stars, and that's one of the biggest reality doctors there is. Um, I gave Dr. Drew a call, and uh, he's willing to talk to us and give us some insight um, about what's going on in people's minds when they get on these shows. So here we are, back in L.A. Now, Dr. Drew, uh, can you tell us why do you think people watch reality television uh, to begin with? I'm not sure. How about that for an answer? Uh, I, I have trouble understanding why some of it is watched. I can tell you, though, I was there when it all got started. And for me, it almost grew out of radio. Uh, Loveline was an example of that. And then someone got the idea of just putting it on television, and lo and behold, people watched. 
Now, on the other flip side of that, why do you think people want to be cast on these shows if we're watching them? There, there is a massive desire to be famous. For the first time in history, we are seeing fame as an independent motivator in young people. If you ask them what do they want to do with their lives, you ask them 40 years ago, they'd say, I want to be a husband, I want to have a good career, I want to, what, they'd have specific sort of goals. Now, they'll say, oftentimes, as their primary goal, I want to be famous. That has never happened before in measured history. So you've never imagined before then becoming a television personality? It's kind of all no, fell into your lap? A, no, mine's been an exploration. Mine's been sort of an interesting exploration. I mean, I, 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 was, <laughs> I was very resistant to it for decades. I would always say, even Loveline, I said, look, I'm a physician, leave me alone. I'll give you Friday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. If we can do this show then, I'll do it. Uh, on the heels of Loveline, I was asked to be on a show uh, which was called Big Brother. And I ended up sort of doing commentary once a week on the live show of what was going on in the house. And it was very unsatisfying, really nothing. I accomplished nothing, in my opinion. And then, and then where'd you go from there? So, I mean, obviously, it, it didn't accomplish anything, but you still saw value in, in being out there and being on television, correct? My naive idea from the beginning was that radio and television had massive impact on our culture, not good. And I thought if, if physicians got involved with it, we could help shape it in a good way. When Celebrity Rehab was proposed to me, it was not my idea, it was someone else's idea, and they wanted me in it, my initial reaction was, um, impossible. No way, no way. You, you, you can't do that. What are you, what are you gonna build a hospital and license it and create, what, what are you gonna do? What, I, what, what is this idea? It was really when I finally had the idea of injecting, taking my team that I had in a hospital where we couldn't do this, and putting this team in a residential facility, that I thought, I bet you could do it, and we did. Do you think we're creating a culture of children that will only try to emulate and recreate the outlandish actions of these reality stars. So basically, are we destroying our society? Uh, it is a very serious concern. When I try to think of what the next generation is going to be, how the next generation is gonna be affected by the ambient culture, it's not what you call good. I mean, my original idea was that television needs to be shaped in such a way that it, you know, it shows something. I mean, that's why I did the therapeutic shows. I think that does have potential to do good. But the what's really popular is stuff that's that glorifies behavior that is not good. And not only not good, but many times disturbed. It, it's, not, it's not a good model for um, human existence. My name's Robert Galinsky. My relationship to reality television is that I make reality TV stars. If you went out into the street and grabbed one person randomly and brought them into me and you gave them a little time with me, I could make them reality TV ready. Would they be a star? That's something that I can't tell you. You out there, if your friends think you're cool, that's great. I need to know why. If I'm gonna cast you, I gotta get specific information from you. I've been trained with wonderful teachers um, on how to do conflict resolution. I've worked with teenagers, I've worked with drug addicts, I've worked with criminals, I've worked with special education students. So I have worked with diverse groups of people many times who are coming together for the first time in a situation where they have to divulge things about themselves and they have to play games with each other and themselves to understand themselves. Duh, that sounds like reality television to me. Do you think it's possible that you can be taught how to be a reality star? Well, I just think the, the, the notion that you could taught to be a reality show is so deeply disturbing to me who is this guy? His name is Robert Galinsky. Was he ever on a show? No. So what makes him able to do this, this school? Um, there's a formula for casting, but it's different for every show. If there was a formula for this, everybody would be on a reality show. So little of it has to do with you. Do you think there's a way to prepare to be on reality television? Is there any way to prepare? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know, I mean... Have you ever heard of the New York Reality TV School? Is this a joke right now? Do they have one? Do they have, do they really? <laughs> no, seriously, do they have that school? Never heard of these things, but uh, it's, it's, it makes my skin crawl. Uh, uh, hats off to them. I, I, but I imagine, though, anybody who's seeking to learn to be on a reality show already has some liabilities. I thought the idea of the show was just to kind of go by your wits. I do not believe there is any way to prepare to be on reality television. 
<laughs> I don't think so, because TV reality is no script, so you can't really act. At least you really want to lie, but then you are going to have to represent somebody which is not you. So if you want people to love you for somebody you're not, I don't think it's really good, but that's just my point of view. I don't think there's any, like, specific, specific, like, well, you know, you have to study this chapter, and if you don't do this thing exactly, you're not going to get on it, because it's more really about, you know, just you, them liking you, you know what I mean? Like, there's nothing really you can do about that, like. You can't study for this. You cannot study to be on a reality TV show. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. We're traveling to Simi Valley in California um, to attend the reality TV school um, class that they're having. They're basically having a class for a weekend to teach people how to get on reality TV. Uh, what happens to us basically when we get off these shows? We get invited to things just like this. We get invited to fly to California and teach a bunch of reality wannabes how to get on a show. And personally, I think it's funny because I don't know how the hell I got on a show. <laughs> I went for an audition and I was me. Now, I love Galinsky. I love the school. I think that they do, you know, a great job in what they're trying to do. I just don't think that it, it, it's something that'll get you where you want to be. Oh, sh 118? Yeah. They are embedding themselves as students. This way, and I'll show you. Say, brother, I believe that's a fool you love. Cause she's quick with her words and she never gave you reason to trust. One of the cool programs that we offer at New York Reality TV School is the Reality Sleepaway Weekend. We put people in that one weekend through the experiences that you would simulate in a reality television uh, production. A quick uh, introduction about what I've been doing. For the past year and a half, I've been running the New York Reality TV School. Three things that we concentrate on. This is the most important stuff. Confidence, authenticity, and what is your story? It's an interesting phenomenon that there are classes like this, that, that reality is its own genre, because this is basically an acting class. Do you guys feel a little momentum now? You're never too young, and you're never too thin. It's just the same old you, with the same old grin. Do you think when you get to 14,000 that they have time to dig out your song, to dig out when they have, you know, tell us a little bit about you? They don't have the time or the energy to work out your best. You gotta bring your best and have it on the surface all the time, ready to go. I was an actor before I did the reality show, so I knew how to go into a room and audition well. Basically, I'm gonna start with my life before Big Brother. I knew how to be, like, open and cute and funny and, and give you the, you know, the quick quip and get in and out and make an impact. And I think that that can be a learned thing. What are you? Um, just a normal guy. Ugh, boring! Going through this training will allow you to perform at a higher level. And I don't mean perform as in acting, I mean perform as in land a plane when you got no engine, when things look like you're gonna crash and burn. You are the dairy farmer. Anybody who works hard is going to walk up there and say, I work hard and I play hard. All right. But use the uniqueness that you have, right? right. So yeah. translate work hard. All right. I get up every 40 yes. 4 30, yeah. and I what? kick ass all yeah. day, yeah. throwing bales, milking cow, and busting balls, and bust my elf's ass. Because they're oh. a bunch of lazy mother Yeah. yeah. Let's do it again. The, so the distinction is that, you know, actors do all that research about who they are and get in tune, then they throw a script over it. In reality, we just do all that research about who we are, what we have to offer the world, and then we go out into improv or a structured or almost manipulated setup by the producers. So that when director says, hey, you guys go sit in a hot tub, or director says, you two get in a boat and start rowing, real things come out through that activity. People flying in from all over the country to come to this LA weekend that we plan. And part of their motivations are, they really want to sink into what's the experience like. You can go to a class, but then you get back in your car, or you know, you get in a cab and you go back home. That's not the same thing. This is where you guys are staying. So it's like a dormitory. Yeah. There is a big difference between going into your bunk and knowing that there's a camera there, and that you're with strangers, and that you have to sleep in this unpredictable environment, and you don't know what's going to happen next. So we give that to people for three days straight. By the second day, most people forget the cameras are there. Most people are really in the groove. Uh, and in our experience in, in LA, and the last one we did, the next morning, a couple of things. The next morning, a couple girls bailed. Are you just a little uncomfortable with this? 
situation. What's we, uh, No, because basically my sister and I were a band, this one, and then my little sister. Okay. We're a pop rock band, and so, you know, we kind of came out here just for the experience. Um, we're not looking to be on, you know, a reality TV show. No, it seemed like a waste of time then. Why come then if you wasn't... Y'all came to fill it out, and then y'all realized this is not what y'all want, uh, so we're going now. Part of the reason was, in our introductions the night before, People disclosed very personal information about themselves. And we ask people to t tell us secrets and, and deep, really things that have affected their lives. One guy was in jail. So these two young ladies woke up the next morning freaked out. Like, I just slept in a dorm, one big room, with the guy who's been in jail. Yeah. Why are you leaving? Is Val? What's the reason? Val, what's the reason? Oh my god, this is creepy. I got to get out of here. Um, so they left, they bailed. Personal. Well, some people took it personal, yeah. A little yeah. judgmental, but I think everyone's situation is different, so I don't think it's fair for them to judge. It feels like they, they on what we're doing here. That's how I feel. My name is Anthony Tavon Felix. I'm from Harlem, New York. Um, uh, I'm a single parent, but I'm, ra I'm raising my nephew. My sister was... Um, you know, she has full-blown AIDS. She kept saying, I want you to raise my son. I was in and out of jail from 14 to 21. The reason why I'm going to LA, Galinsky. I, I feel so much more comfortable uh, revealing who I am as a person. And um, I think I can just, just go for the ride. Why not? I mean, like, what the f like, why not? Give reality a try, and hopefully I can get something out of it, and it can help me give the life that I'm trying to give my nephew that I wasn't able to share. <laughs> reality television is just a filter for what Robert Galinsky's been doing for 20 years. Working with people, helping people, getting people to communicate better, finding the best in people. That's what I've been doing for 20, 20 years. And now this is just another filter for me to do that. If I'm riding the wave of reality television right now and it's a natural fit with what I do, that's what I'm doing. Triumphantly, congratulations, New York Reality TV School graduates, yeah! The reality school has one possible useful part, and that is only when the people who are on reality shows speak. We're gonna start with a, with a little thing I've developed. We're gonna, one at a time, we're gonna come up here. I want you to stand in the middle here, and it's called first impression exercise. We were on shows, we were there, we went through it, we lived the life after. We're the only ones who knows what really goes on. If I amp up my personality, if they think I talk loud, I'm gonna talk louder. If they think I'm yelling, I'm gonna yell louder. If they don't like I'm cursing, I'm gonna say Fuck you. However, there's another intrinsic problem in this. I don't help anyone when I speak. They're asking me the wrong questions. They're asking me what would, what would I do different on my show well, that doesn't matter. My show's done, and it's not coming back. What would I do different? I'd win the goddamn money. I'd, ki I'd kiss the right, the right a instead of the wrong a That's what I would do different on my show. So you give them tips on how to get on reality television, basically? We give them tips on how to get on, how to make the most of your time on the show, and then uh, once you're off the show, we give, like, a little bit of how, how to capitalize on that. I nailed it in, like... I don't know, 45 seconds is all I took. I've spoken the most time of a reality celebrity. I've spoken the second most times, second only to Billy Garcia. The New York Reality TV School has been like chum in the ocean of sharks for press. People know that when they come, they're going to get exposure because I opened that school up, and within two months, I was on The View, Nightline. I was on The Today Show, E! Entertainment, TV Guide Channel. I was in Israeli newspapers, Australian newspapers. I still do Australian morning television. They love me. For some students, the seminar, which costs around $200, has confirmed their initial ambition. I knew I made it when I had that little sidebar article in Women's World. That was when I knew I was going to the top. Can you tell us a little bit about the screening process of reality shows? Yeah, the screening, I, 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 there's, a, there's a world of casting. And these people are very skillful, and they go out into the world, and they find people, and they can kind of sense who would look good on reality show. And it, they, they look for a certain type. They, they want to they wanna cast a certain person to, to appeal to a certain demographic. So it's like, you know, you look at that, and you're like, oh, that's me. That's the type of person I am. This guy reminds me of me. This girl reminds me of her or my girlfriend. So that's how they do it, you know what I mean? So the formula is be yourself, put 
your personal issues, loves, desires, the things that touch your soul and heart, make sure they're right on the surface. No, don't be yourself. Yourself sucks. Well, what if I'm boring or how do I make it interesting? Be yourself, push it up a little bit. Shine that light a little brighter. This is entertainment, not reality. It's entertainment. The real advice is that you have to go into the audition like I did, knowing what they're looking for, but with a twist and really play into what they want you to be. They're looking for the real personality. And then that real personality has to fit into their um, uh, qualifications, who they're looking for, who they want to pit against other people. So you have the angry ethnic female, and then you'll have like the sympathy character. Look for somebody that that catches their eye in a room uh, for whatever reason, usually not because of how they look, but how they behave. I mean, I think I was cast because I was the black guy, you know, like the, the really black guy. Like, there was you know, another black guy no, on the show. No, but I was the black dude, nah. like the really dark-skinned black guy. Stereotyped or typecasted, what, people who are selecting reality contestants select them for very, very specific, detailed reasons, and they try to find out, yeah, I'm gay, I, have, I'm, I adopted a, a, a kid, I was in the military for, for five years. I went to West Point. I, the, all of these silly characteristics, uh, which, which on their own don't seem like much, put, put together are who I am. And that little package is, huh, now let's, let's take that little package and compare it with this one over here. Ah, Rudy, he's 72, he's a Navy SEAL, he's, he's kind of set in his ways, pretty homophobic. When I go home, my wife asks me about who was with you, I'll say a queer that ran around bare ass half of the time, for one thing. Ah, gay, homophobic, put them on the same team, let's see what happens. You know, they know how to create a fire, rub two sticks together, and that's the same thing they're doing with contestants. They're looking to create sparks. Humans throughout history watch crazy people being crazy. That, that's what drama is. That's what daytime dramas were. That's what movies are. It, these are not healthy people having boring, healthy lives. It's crazy people acting crazy. Let's go ahead and put them in a room, throw a bee's nest in there, hit it with a stick, close the door, turn the camera on, and that's just TV. You know what I mean? What's the most common question fans ask you? Wow, the most common question is, how did I get on? Or what did I do to get on? What did I say that got me booked on? That was the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life. Getting on I Love New York was probably the easiest thing I've got on. I didn't even really know what I'd been selected for. Each reality show has a separate process. VH1 actually found me on MySpace. Yo, I, I cast reality shows and you got a, a look, man. I tried out for Hell's Kitchen and bam, I was on the show. And then becomes the psychological screening. There was two or three different psych tests. So they asked real detailed questions. That was like, whoa. I would say like dictionary thick. Are they safe to be on a reality show or is this process, whatever stress it that creates, gonna cause someone harm? But I, I think they want people who would be attractive to an audience, but also who would, who would be, might be maybe a little bit on the edge. Some girl like comes over and taps me on the shoulder. Hey, I've been watching you, and I think that you'd be great for the show. Perfect, just crazy enough to do a reality show. But I think they like crazy. So it's not about being good looking, it's about just not being ugly enough that people don't want to watch you. Once you got your golden ticket, like you're going to Hollywood, you know, you, you're in, start working on your submerged swimming. They sequestered us. And then when you get there, it's like Attica. For a couple of weeks, I think. You're all locked up. It was like, it was like James Bond. They had people with the headpiece and the earpiece. You don't get to talk to your family. Wasn't allowed to have my phone. You don't get any contact with the outside world. So then we get into the van to go to the mansion. They're like, don't talk to each other. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, Jeff Probst comes out. I've been watching this guy for 10 years on TV. There he is. He's standing right there. He's right there. So then when we get there, then we finally, they finally like let us, you know, out, let us loose. <laughs> I'm French, I'm sexy, and I love to be naked. I turned around and looked for the camera, and I yelled, we're all going to die!
your mindless television. Woohoo! Holy crap, that fat naked guy's still here. Get some footage. Georgica has a lot of A-list events. The newest one coming up is the Ferrari Rally. I'll have over $200 million of Ferraris in Georgica's parking lot. We host the event. They shut down Montauk Highway. They have a huge rally. They start the party at Georgica. They finish the party at Georgica. And everybody from Jerry Seinfeld to uh, Ralph Lauren will be there. TMZ always shows up, wants to talk <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity, man. I do, I do, I do everything. The reason I make money is because the fans out there relate with me, and they like want to see me do good, and they and they uh, they like the projects I do. You know what I mean? Charity events for Eckerd, doing charity events for Wounded Warrior Project. I do a lot of events uh, with celebrities. I cook uh, for uh, athletes like Doc Good and Yogi Berra. Hank Aaron has me fly out to Atlanta, and I cook him gumbo. You know what I mean? Hank Aaron's the man. He signs baseballs and bats. All fans, all fans like the other fans, you know what I mean? They watch Hell's Kitchen, they watch reality, they go nuts. I got tied in with uh, the Moonlight Bunny Ranch, the Cat House series with Dennis Hoff on HBO. Um, Madam Suzette and Dennis all watch Hell's Kitchen. I'm Dennis Hoff, the owner of the world-famous Moonlight Bunny Ranch. I'm also the star of HBO's Cat House series. I am Madam Suzette, and I've been the general manager of the world-famous Moonlight Bunny Ranch for the last 18 years. We have helped reality TV explode. We've also changed uh, sexual attitudes in America. It was a one-off show. We did the one show. Highest rated non-fiction show HBO had ever done. When it came on, everybody in America is around their water cooler. And that's what the talk was the next day. Robert flew out, he was so generous, so sweet. He flew out here, took time off of his busy, busy schedule, and he took over the cooking. And I tried to get him not to do it. I said, why don't you just enjoy the party? Dennis, I'm cooking for you. And uh, he cooked the greatest stuff last night. <laughs> Robert, Robert's very unique. He's very unique and he's very complex, okay? First of all, he's a big, imposing character, okay, which gets people's attention. He's, he's got a little bit of a smart mouth to him, but he's a sweetheart guy. And the combination of those things with, with humor, uh, his size, uh, and that he's bright, it just works. Robert, thank you. I can't thank you enough. This is my dear friend, guys, and the greatest chef in the world. Did you all see Hell's Kitchen when he pulled his pants down and moaned moan, 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 Ramsey? Yeah, I know you did. It was worth whatever stress you may go through. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You have 15 people out of thousands that apply. You know what I mean? What are you going to do? Say, I got to pay the light bill? I, I got I to gotta put my life, your sh life that you had on hold and you never know what doors are gonna open like I have a million doors slammed in my face and uh, uh, and then you have an opportunity you know Mr. Opportunity knocking on your window you know what I mean so you know take it Or two on television? Yeah. <laughs> don't look at me. I, I don't know if I get a camera. It's just, uh, aren't you a celebrity? <laughs> I mean, think about it. You're being chauffeured to Virginia right now. Think of how much of a celebrity you oh, are. Oh, yeah. Huge yeah, celebrity. My God, I'm so famous. I gotta tell you who I am. I don't think anyone, any one of us can legitimately say our 15 minutes was equal to Jersey Shore season one in 15 minutes. I mean, it's a different quality of 15 minutes. It's... And now we're gonna find out what happens on your 16th minute. That's what reality says. You hope to one day get your own house, <laughs> your own mobile home. A lot of these crazy reality events, like you can go to them and there's no money in it because that bubble has burst. This is not the first couple seasons of Survivor where those people were, were where people were so focused on them. And, and people were paying like $10,000 for them to come someplace. 
That moment has passed because there's so many reality shows on so many channels. <laughs> Hello, Paul Grassi. Nice to meet Hi, you, Melissa. Melody. Melody. I'm Melody. 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 Nice to meet you, Melody. What show are you girls on? Frank the Entertainer. Oh, you guys want Frank too? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Hey. Paul Grassi. Yeah, man. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Survivor. There you go. Krista. Krista. Nice, nice to meet you. I'm Melody. Hi. Nice the community of reality TV people, from cooking shows to Survivor to Biggest Loser to The Mole, it's funny how we're all in this club and everybody kind of knows each other and friends of friends. 99.9% .9 of people will never be on the reality show. Of that 0.1% that's left over, or even less, only maybe 5% of them can make a legitimate career after this. The other 95%, you're going to go back to your life. Can you get rich? Can you get rich become, being a reality star? If you want to go into reality television to get rich, you probably will find that there's other ways to make money. Reality television, if you, can, you could probably name how many stars are making good livings off of their reality TV fame. You know, and then there's weird opportunities to make money, like you may go and do like some crazy reality event where they pay you $500 to fly out and meet 1,500 fans. That's not me. It's, it's a way to earn a living, and it's also a, an interesting way to approach life. It's weird, it's bizarre, and, and there are fun things that can come from it. I am so jazzed that they're doing this celebrity rally. I think celebrity TV is where it's at. It's always exciting. It's true to life. It's, it's, it's life. never thought I could make money doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah? You like to cook? You want to be a chef? Yeah? The fans is what how you make the money. The fans. And you self-promote yourself. Well, you mentioned other people that said they make money. How do you make your money right now? Uh, I make my money being Billy from, from Survivor, honestly. All right. You make your money from being Billy from Survivor. How much money can Billy from Survivor make? Uh, in, a, in a decent weekend, I can make $1,740 in a weekend. I started the, uh, the Reality Castaways dodgeball event, which is uh, a bunch of us reality stars come and, uh, and play dodgeball, and pr like professional, like the movie dodgeball, and fans pay money to either play with or against Survivors or just to sit and watch. And the tickets go for as much as thousand dollars a head, and uh, that's 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 a great event. And so, then, so you get people to pay over a thousand dollars to come play dodgeball with you <laughs> at a reality event. At, at a reality event, and so, wait, uh, so somebody pays over a thousand dollars to come play dodgeball with a bunch dodgeball. of reality dodgeball a, stars. Dodgeball. Uh, I want you to say okay. that someone pays over a thousand. I want you to tell me that. Okay. Please tell me that. Okay, several people pay over a thousand dollars to play dodgeball with us reality stars. There's charity soccer games in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's reality rallies in Temecula. There's reality conventions in Nashville. 
Um, and I think that that's the thing that I'm the most happy about. You know, without reality television, I would still be sitting at home watching TV. People have paid me to host their backyard version of Survivor. And, uh, and what, is that, what does that entail? Uh, you get a group of fans together, 16, uh, traditionally, hopefully. Basically, from crack of dawn until nightfall, we play a one-day version of the game of Survivor. And then once it's over, we have a barbecue. What do you think is more appealing, the money or the fame? Well, it depends on the individual, of course. But I think fame is the, is the motivator. And there's very little to be gained monetarily, usually. You definitely have to make yourself a brand. OK. You, you, and you have to be a media whore, honest to god. They're the ones, they're the fuel for your vehicle. So this journey has taken me to places that I would have never imagined. From wrestling events in Virginia to reality rallies in California, the opportunities are endless. Problem is, I still have a family to feed, and most of these so-called events really don't pay anything. There's a small, small club of us that actually make money. I have a PR agent. I have a booking agent. I have a PR firm. Uh, my two restaurants I own, I have a PR firm. So you got to keep your name out there. It costs money to make money. Make sure everybody has, everybody has a mouthpiece. You know, this is all entertainment. We should have a great time to know you can uh, just have fun with it. I'm a walking billboard for the show, you know what I mean? I'm 450 pounds, you know what I mean? It's like Kool-Aid running down the street. I think that when the lifespan of somebody that has been on a reality TV show, unless you've won a lot of money on that particular show and then reinvested it or done something else with that money to further your career, I think it's a very short lifespan in terms of being in the public eye. can't put a number on it, but I can tell you that, you know, you can do autograph signings and make 150 bucks a day if you, if you hustle. You got to do everything on your own. If you're, if you're attempting to make any kind of living at this, you better be ready to work at it, even before, during, and after the show. People see you on TV. They see you on a series of shows. It's not like you're on the news for one episode. They see you on TV. And then they say, oh, this guy must be doing good. He's, they live in LA, they live in Hollywood and everything. And yeah, people have a giant misconception about that. But how much can you make? The question is, how much can you make? Can you make, can you make over $100,000? You can make over $100,000, but you have to stay busy. You can't wait for stuff to come have to you. Have you made over $100,000 signing autographs? Uh, geez, the IRS is going to get me like they did Richard Hatch. <laughs> no, I am not advertising a giant skull for Liquid Blue. Not everyone is. See, that, that, that niche has been filled. At best, you can host a club, maybe endorse a local product for your friend at best, maybe get a free slice of pizza here and there, topping is extra. That's, that's what you're going to be at best. Well, you get to sit better places than restaurants. It's easier to get into restaurants. And, that, and people say that jokingly, but that's about it, that's, as far as I'm concerned. I actually did think going on reality TV was going to bump the career, because like when I went on Out of New York, I specifically went on there and was like, yo, I'm a rapper, and I got music, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, it, it helped in a way, because it was, you know, a couple, like, it was like millions of people that watched it. And you know, I got a lot of people downloading the music, but as far as like, you know, my expectations, like I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get a record deal next year. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna meet all these people. And you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. I work for Chef Revival, which is the company who makes the official Hell's Kitchen jacket. I wear the jacket, man. Like they get free press out of it. I get free jackets and I get a little paper. I mean, the prize on Big Brother is very specific. It's, it's $500,000 if you win, 50,000 if you are first runner up. Um, if you aren't one of those, you get seven fifty a week. That's what they pay you to be there, flat. The least amount, the least amount would probably be around thirty-five grand or so, give or take. But if, like I said, you can go on there, and depending on the size of the cast, you can do terrible. You can be the biggest schmo out there, and, and land on your face, kind of like I did, 
and, and still walk away with 50 grand or so, 65 grand, depending on where you finish. I think that a lot of people think I have a lot more money than I do. I mean, look, I did good for myself, but I, by all means, am not a millionaire. It's because of the fact that I did not go do third season, fourth season of the show, fifth season. If I would have went on those seasons of Jersey Shore, I would have been a millionaire right now. But I, I don't think money could really buy happiness, to be honest with you. Um, I just wish I could have made that money somewhere else. This is not life-changing money we're talking about. We're talking about, yeah, you gotta be really specific with that money to grow that money into something else along the way. But this ain't like, wham, bam, I won the, the multi-billion dollar lottery and I don't have to work again. You still gotta get up every day and go to work. You cannot win $500,000 on a reality show like The Amazing Race, like Big Brother, and think that you can go to work the next day and tell your boss to bugger off. You can't. You better go back to work and be on your P's and Q's and hope after three months ain't nobody replaced you. Now, here's two survivors who almost didn't survive the game they were playing. Was it worth it for them? He's burnt. He's burnt pretty bad, Terry. I came back to the camp, and the fire had gone out, and it was really easy to restart the fire. I needed to cook the fish. So I threw some dried sticks and leaves on the fire, and what you would do is stir up the hot coals, and I was bent over the fire, blowing on the hot coals, and they would glow bright red, and the leaves and the sticks would start smoldering, and the smoke would get thicker and thicker. And as the smoke got to its thickest point right before it caught fire, the wind changed directions, and it blew the smoke in my face as I was inhaling to take another breath. And the last thing I remember as I was passing out on the way down is reaching my arms out to break my fall, as you would do instinctively. And the weight of my body just buried my hands deep into the hot embers. And I laid face first in that fire pit for about 15 seconds before um, people around started to notice. I looked down at my hands and I just made a beeline to the river. It was just an incredible, intense amount of pain. I had burned my hands so completely that the entirety of my skin from the wrist down, I had completely burned all the skin off and it was just hanging down. Oh, oh, keep my. your hands in the oh, water. My God. So they got me on an airplane and I went three hours to Brisbane to the number one burn center in Australia and they um, brought in the five top burn surgeons in Australia. They said, we're gonna do a series of three skin grafting operations on your hands uh, to repair your hands. Um, we're gonna do the best we can, but your hands are never gonna be the same as they were. It's an amazing story. The chief of surgery at the number one burn center in Australia took the bandages off my hands, and he said, that's impossible. He said, what's happened to your hands is medically inexplainable. Same doctor that has been treating me for 10 days, he could see new skin growing, and he could see progress, and I didn't really understand it, but he said, I think you're gonna be okay. They kicked me right out of the hospital. And they put me in the outpatient center right next door and I came back every day for seven days. And after seven days, he said, get out of here, you're gonna be fine. The fact that I still have the use of my hands, it's such a blessing I never have forgotten, even after nine years later, that I still have my hands and I still am grateful for what God did for me. I think it was like about September of 2000, I was sitting on my couch and was channel surfing, and I saw this brother running through the jungle, some fat white guy sitting in a tree, and I'm like, what in the heck is this? That was my first introduction to this thing called Survivor. And we get on this challenge called This is the Man Test, and basically it was these two huge balls. One of the contestants was strapped into each ball. We had to push it for about half a mile get to this maze and work the ball through the maze. Easy, no problem. I was pretty much done halfway through pushing this ball. I had passed out on top of the maze, kind of seized a little bit, went to stand up, fell down, and apparently I passed out three times. The next thing I know, I hear Jeff saying, he's pulling me out of the game. Suffice it to say, when I watched the show, um, yeah, I was definitely checking out. And it made sense to me then why it is they pulled me out. Still pissed off because I'm a competitor. And brother didn't want to go out on his back. I tried eight times to get on this show. 
nine years, and this is how it's gonna end? So it was extremely demoralizing. Um, if you were given a choice to go on another show, would you? Yes. Would I do it again? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd do, I do one of those shows again. Oh, I'd love to be on more shows. You know, reality stars are fame horse. Unbelievably, I would do Big Brother again in a second. Once it gets in your blood, it's, it's, it's hard to get out. I would do it again. I, I wouldn't hesitate. Yeah, I would do things again. I mean, this is, this is a business. Uh, I don't think so, because I don't like to do twice the same thing, because it's boring. Bring it back one more time for me. <laughs> I'm not only living my 16th minute, my 16th hour, in my 16th week, in my 16th year, I'm living the life of a king. You'll use that. Why do you think people watch reality television to begin with? I think reality television is uh, being watched and has become successful because people get to see real people in real situations. People watch reality television to, in some cases, many cases, to laugh at the other, to feel better about themselves. Well, it's smashed right now. So a show that features Jersey Shore, you know, a, a Snooki, or a show even like Hoarders, that shows people in desperate situations, we'll, we'll watch that to uh, feel a little bit better about ourselves. We'll watch that to also gauge where, where am I in the world? The degree to which some of this has deteriorated, it's hard for me to understand what makes people watch. It, it seems like they watch for uh, schadenfreude now. Uh, I, it makes me feel better to see other people behaving badly. I think it's a twofold kind of appeal. I think the first is that it offers an escape. And I think that, you know, that's what's unique to television in general, regardless of whether it's reality or scripted, it takes you away from where you are. You know, like, let's say you had a bad day at work. Well, certainly that's not as bad as, like, you know, Trump making fun of you in the boardroom. Richard, you're fired. It's that sort of rooted in, whoa, you know, while this is on TV, I see myself in this, you know, situation which I never thought was possible. I knew why Survivor would be successful. It's, it's a look into who people are and what choices they make, and we can compare ourselves to how these players act, what choices they make. So a lot of people will come in thinking that they want to be famous, and we'll, I'll start with, well, what, what do you want to do? What for? And they'll unravel it to the point where you find out that they have a damaged relationship between themselves and their dad, and they want to clarify that somehow. That's what the root of wanting to be loved and liked is, famous. Now, do you think that it's specific people or there's specific personality traits that are related to these individuals that seek out fame or celebrity? You, I actually have the only published data on this. A friend of mine came to me who was a business school professor at the University of Southern California and said, you know, we ought to we had to measure what's going on in these people. So we gave them all narcissistic personality inventories. And we published this data, and we were able to show very clearly that people that seek the celebrity have a narcissistic liability. You don't want to become famous? I'm famous enough. <laughs> you stupid, I hate you. You know what, though? Seriously, fame, mm -hmm. money. Money. Money much better. I may be an idealist, but I think everybody has something to offer, and this has, this genre has democratized the fame. One thing that people don't comment on is reality television doesn't have a laugh track. I'm not being told when to laugh. I'm not being told when to, to go, oh, and feel something. Sitcoms manipulate and coerce worse than reality television. It's spontaneous. It's the closest thing to like a live sporting event. Anything can happen. And that's what people are hungry for as viewers. If I see one more show about cops, Lawyers, doctors, I'm gonna vomit. <laughs> hey, one more thing, and you tell me if you want this to camera or not, but I'll tell you this. For those who think that reality television is going away or is a fad, you're a dinosaur. Continue to watch Law & Order. It's okay. Who are you, and what is your relationship to reality television? My name is Paul Grassi, and I was on season five of The Mole. Paul, a 29-year-old utility worker from Yonkers, New York. And I am currently directing a film on reality television. Did you think it was going to make you rich and famous? 
I, I actually, I, I was one of the, the stupid ones. Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I didn't think it would make me rich, per se, right off the bat. I did think that the, the fame of being on a network show and having multiple millions of people watch you on a daily basis, I thought that would bring some notoriety, whether good or bad. You know, I thought that it would bring me something to at least leave my day job, let's say, and pursue a career in something in entertainment. Now, I've done other things. I've done smaller things in entertainment. I've done, you know, internet shows. I've done stuff, but it's, 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 it's never been to the extent, hey, I'm on a network show and six million people are watching me every Monday night. You know, so that's, that's very appealing. And I thought that that, you know, could lead to other things. We're fed this dream. We're fed this dream with reality television that anybody can be picked off the street and you can become an instant celebrity and become, like you, you said, rich and famous. But that's an illusion. That's, that's, that's what people watch you with. That's what makes you watch a show. Now you have regular people that are giving up careers. They're giving up their families. They're giving up, they're giving up their whole lives for this, this illusion that there's something at the end of that rainbow. And if anybody believes that there's a pot of gold at the end, end of the rainbow, you're stupid. Paul is the only player still waiting to see if he'll get to see his family tonight. People don't realize you're gone from your families, your lives, everything, everything in your life. You're gone. You're gone for an undisclosed amount of time. You know, what does that mean to you? I was willing to give up my career. I was willing to, to I mean, it's scary to say, but I was willing to to not risk my relationship with my family because I have a great wife and my wife, we talked about it extensively beforehand. And she said to me, Paul, this is, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, as much as I'm jealous and I wanna be able to go and do these crazy things, I want you to go and do it. If I didn't have someone to back me up, I don't know if, if, if it would have been an easy transformation for me. It's, it's, it's the weirdest, and for anyone who has children, well, no, it's the weirdest thing to be walking down a street in Manhattan, have someone call out your daughter's name. I never realized it would be like that. I, I knew that there's a potential of people knowing you who you are, seeing you on the street, but I never thought that it could possibly affect my family. And when, the first day I walked down the street and I had some random lady say, oh my God, there's Alexa from the mall. It freaked me out and I didn't know how to react to it. I didn't know what to do. But, you know, and that made me realize very quickly that it wasn't only me. I didn't put myself out there. I put everybody in my family out there. And that's one of the most common mistakes a person going on reality television makes. Not foreseeing the effects that could, that could possibly, that this, could, this, this ordeal, this life-changing experience could possibly have on everybody else around you. Paul, are you ready for your quiz results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a good game, guys. I knew it. Please pick up your bag and come with me. Paul was a very strong player. He deserved to be in the Final Four, for sure. As you look back, what stands out? Is there certain moments? I think every aspect of this game I'm going to look back on and say it was a great experience. I thought that being able to beat Paul would be a lot more sweet. And I'm actually kind of sorry to see him go. I mean, he was a great motivator because I wanted to kick his butt. Take it easy. Take care, Slick. Too bad, too bad you couldn't hear anything I said. Being on television and having people recognize you can be a profound experience. It can be something that can change and, and alter your life forever. I think in a way it may have for me as well. I think ultimately people do it either for vanity or for money. Uh, the camera reloads. Good. 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 Did we learn anything? I don't know, that's up to you. Perception is everything, and you're the only person who can tell whether you believe what you've heard or not. I started this journey looking to, to find out the true questions of, is reality television real? Or, you know, what other people's experiences were. 
But in the end, I, I don't know. Did I do this all just to become famous again? <laughs> did I do this to extend my 16th minute? The experience itself was great. It's how we manage it afterwards that makes us or breaks us. Some people go on to be huge successes, and others go on to be what they were meant to be, themselves. <laughs> that was awesome. And you don't have anything, right, Mr. Question? OK. We all have our 16th minute, no matter what you do. If you're a lawyer, a politician, sports figure, a doctor, a, a mother staying at home with her child, we all have that glory for 15 minutes. And at some time, it's got to end. And we all go on our journey to our 16th minute. Hmm. Wonder who I could check out next. If you go on a reality show, remember that there are good and bad aspects of it. For anyone who wants to be on a reality show, I think you're talking to the right guy to give you some advice. And my advice is, don't f up your interview. Be careful what you say, because that stuff will come back to bite you one year later, five years later, 10 years later. You're going to look at things that happen during the course of the show, and it's going to just eat you up every day. You're going to stew over it. Please don't quit your day job. Don't skip your education. You just got to go there and, and, and do it. I do not regret one second of the adventure that I had on that show. What makes you big is not whether you win the show or you lose the show. I've lost the show twice. I do more than any of the winners have ever done. It's how you present yourself as a person and how you present yourself later after that event. It's not real. It's not reality. It's not. It's hyper-reality. It's manipulated. But I will promise you this, that it will change your life forever. Whether it be good or bad, it's up to you. So if you're complaining that it doesn't look real or it's not authentic, it's not. Don't complain. Go to Law & Order. Have fun. Try to have fun. But be careful, because it is a world of 